Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, fascinating uh, webinar and to comment on two uh, extremely interesting presentations. Um, it's of course very interesting to see uh, in the presentation of Professor Franks that he confirms in studies uh, experiences that we have actually made uh, on the same level uh, in continental uh, Europe. Uh, at the same time, I agree with Professor Meyer that uh, measuring success only with the short-term profits or short-term price returns is, is too simplistic. Uh, and it's very interesting uh, to ask ourselves the question as well, uh, what is the purpose of activism? Uh, where does it really create value uh, versus just engage in uh, wealth transfer? And I will try to address that in my comments uh, today and right now. In the first set of comments, I would really like to go a bit more into the differentiation of very different activist uh, styles, because I think the label activists uh, really covers many, many different strategies. On the one end of the spectrum, you really have the very short term uh, activisms, uh, activism. Um, there are funds that purely fo focus on, on short-term uh, bump in the share price, maybe just this announcement effect that Professor Franks has uh, talking about, then they are out again. They may use extensive leverage, they may use derivatives and short other stocks, and that completely alters their payout structure and incentives. Uh, they may use laws designed to protect minority shareholders and just extort a higher premium for the buyer in a takeover process. And I think everybody is very right to question the motives and the value that such funds really add to the society. But there are very different kinds of activists as well. And I would count uh, Mizaki Capital um, and as well as Sevian among them. Um, you will be interesting to hear that Sevian actually has an average holding period of uh, their investments of five years. In some instances, we have been invested in a company for more than 10 years. We don't short, we don't leverage, we actually hold large positions in companies and that takes months to get in and out. And so we can credibly say that our incentives are completely aligned with those of long-term owners. And in many instances, we are actually exactly playing the role of an anchor shareholder in an otherwise fragmented ownership base, uh, which, as Professor Meyer has laid, la laid out, is only getting more fragmented with the advent of passive index ownership. Uh, one tangible example of that is, is that we are demanding now from all companies that they include tangible and measurable ESG targets into their executive compensation system. This is because we are firmly convinced that in order to achieve long-term success and remain profitable. Companies need to address these challenges now. Customer interests are changing. If you don't offer green and sustainable products, you will actually grow less and be less profitable than those that do. And purely financial targets will not incentivize the necessary changes that are needed right now. Another dimension uh, that has also been addressed is how public or hostile activism is. Also there, Sevian is on the more constructive end of the spectrum when it comes to activism. Uh, we have also made the experience that constructive dialogue, fact-based and in private is much more successful, uh, also in continental Europe, not only in Japan. Uh, one word of caveat to there is of course that this constructive the success rate of a constructive engagement clearly depends on the situation in certain situations change is difficult for the stakeholders constructive dialogue is not happening and not possible and then we see it actually as our responsibility to step up the engagement um, we firmly believe that this is our responsibility and that hearing different views, even if they're inconvenient uh, for the moment, is beneficial for the success uh, of the company in the long term. A second set of comments uh, I would like to give and uh, share some practical experience um, with regards to the alternative models of ownership that uh, Professor Mayer mentioned. Um, so you might know that Sevian is only operating in Northern Europe. So that's exactly those countries where alternative governance models 
are actually very common. We have extensive experience with uh, stakeholder participations in boards where we are present. We have anchor share. We have worked together with anchor shareholders as owners. We have worked under dual share classes, voting rights limitations, uh, etc. And to be clear, I think there are many, many positive examples and experiences with those models. We generally, we generally operate in, a, in an in governance environment, which is very mature and very positive uh, for successful outcomes. But for this discussion, however, I think it's much more interesting to focus on those examples where actually they haven't produced the desired results. And I would like to mention two examples here. Uh, one uh, is obviously uh, ThyssenKrupp, a company where I, where I am uh, presently on the board. That company has always had a foundation as a large anchor shareholder, and it has extensive employee participation. Uh, to understand that, so if you look at the current board, the current board in a two-tier board, so the supervisory board, is composed of 20 people. 10 of those people are employee representatives, so directly uh, elected by the employees. Two are assigned by the foundation, the majority, um, uh, the, the major anchor shareholder, and eight are elected by other shareholders. Unfortunately, Tucson Group also nevertheless has a dismal track record, has been producing negative cash flows and underperforming peers for at least the past decade, and has been extremely difficult and resistant to change. Another example is the case of Panalpina. Panalpina is a, log a Swiss logistic company uh, where we have been invested uh, very successfully. Panalpina had a foundation as a dominant shareholder and it even had a voting right limitation preventing any other shareholder from building up an equivalent power. So that was an effective takeover defense. But still, it underperformed peers and was unable to change course for more than a decade as well. What has gone wrong in those cases? Let me first focus on employee board representation that is very common in Germany. In my experience, employee board representat representatives have one main goal or purpose, and that is to protect the existing German workforce. Now that is clearly a much too narrow focus. First, they are only concerned about the German workforce force. and many global corporations today, the majority of the workforce is, is not located in Germany anymore. Second, this goal is not fully consistent with an overall purpose of a corporation. You can easily see that this creates conflicts. If you look at big structural challenges that the automotive or the steel industry is facing with decarbonization, with electrification, you can clearly see that many products and jobs that they will need to change in order to actually for the company to change and achieve uh, uh, that target. But that is completely squared with the main purpose of the employee representatives in the boardroom. So instead of a constructive problem solving involving many perspectives, what you actually get in the boardroom is entrenched partisan politics, to opposing benches, uh, uh, which, which create standoffs similar to probably what you see in a British or US parliament today. And that actually rather leads to a, a delay of necessary change and unfortunately for settling of the lowest, for the lowest common denominator and definitely not for the right solution. So my question to Professor Mayer here would be is how, how can actually one ensure that all stakeholders in the board act as true owners of the corporations rather than as pure agents of their constituents and who is holding them accountable to that? If we then turn to large foundations as anchor shareholders, they are of course only as good as the people running them. And in foundations, especially those where the original founder family is not present anymore, you often actually have a self-governing, self-selecting committee. They might see themselves more as philanthropists, not able or willing to get too involved into the companies they own. Some get personally much too close to the executives that are running the company. 
And so they fail to get an outside perspective and therefore they don't provide sufficient oversight and challenge. The effect is that necessary change in a company is not happening. If a company has additional protection measures like voting right limitations, as in the case of Panalpina, then that effectively prevents any outside threat. And then complacency can set in and underperformance can actually persist for a very long time. So in my experience, some outside checks and balances are actually very, very healthy for the long-term success of a company. And an activist can really uh, provide that kind of outside checks and balances. Thank you very much.